Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive methods of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. If you like the video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you will be notified when future videos are posted. We also would appreciate it if you can make a tax-deductible donation to support our mission of providing stress-free dog education and resources. A link to donate is in the description below, along with links to our website and other resources to stress-free training. Enjoy the webinar. Welcome to your Dog's Friends webinars, and especially to today's webinar on walking your reactive dog. I know that many of you think that you are the only person with a reactive dog, so I want you to know that over a thousand people registered for this webinar. That may help you feel better, who knows? Before we start, let me tell you something about our speakers, uh, Marnie Montgomery and Sarah Stoikas. Marnie is the founder and lead trainer of Joyful Dog in Leesburg, Virginia. She is a certified professional dog trainer, knowledge assessed, level four Pat Miller certified trainer, and certified Tellington T-Touch practitioner. Sarah Stoikas is a Karen Pryor Academy certified training partner. She founded and trained through Laughing Dog Academy in Rockville, Maryland. Both Marnie and Sarah provide humane, force-free training and behavior modification in private lessons as well as in classes for your dog's friend. They co-teach our reactive dog class and will share their insights and experience with you today. I know that you will learn a lot from Marnie and Sarah, and I'm going to turn it over to them right now. Thank you, Deborah. So I'm Marnie Montgomery. You can see by the window that I am. Um, and we're really looking forward to talking with you about your reactive dogs today. Um, since it's in webinar format, feel free to turn off your video. We'll mostly be um, communicating through chat. Sarah and I will leave our video on unless you go, no, please turn it off, in which case we'll <laughs> thank you and turn our video off. <laughs> but we are delighted you all are here. Okay, so here we go. Um, I have a feeling that a lot of you could answer this question what is reactivity? Certainly, I know that all of you can answer what it looks like, the lunging, the barking, the growling, the snarling. Um, I think we probably all have that in common with our dogs. Reactivity is a hypersensitivity to things in your dog's world. And I think it's really, really important to understand that what underlies most reactivity is, um, is fearfulness. It's, uh, and it looks, I know it looks very aggressive, um, but it's in fact a dog trying to create distance, which seems crazy. I think we think of a dog who's fearful as shying away or hiding or running away or something. Um, but in fact, when you think about it, if you're on a leash and you're afraid of something, probably your best defense is to put on a big scary offense. Whoa, 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 stay away. Uh, and if you think about it, normally their strategy works quite well. Uh, so it's, it's gonna be important to understand what's underlying it because what we wanna do when we're training is address the underlying issue. That's gonna be really critical. We're not treating symptoms, we're actually addressing the underlying issue. Um, there are some dogs who will be react, become reactive out of an overenthusiasm, wanting to meet dogs, wanting to meet people or whatever that trigger for their reactivity is. Um, that excitement turns into extreme frustration. Um, and so it can actually be quite unpleasant for the dog. Uh, so you may, you may or may not know which drives your dog's reactivity. The good news is in terms of training, it doesn't really matter that much because we work with it in the same way. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're sitting here wondering, don't worry. Um, okay, let's see. So why don't we go to the next slide, Marnie? Okay. Okay. So you'll be hearing us talk quite a bit about thresholds, dogs being above and below threshold. Uh, and this is a really critical thing to understand with your dog 
Um, so in this graphic, you can see we have a, a line on the bottom representing your dog being completely relaxed. As they start to ramp up, uh, they get closer and closer to that threshold. When they go over that threshold, that's when you're getting that reaction. And that is a place where your dog cannot think clearly. It's not possible that part of their brain actually isn't functioning. Um, it's really more fight or flight. Think about, um, you know, the equivalent with a person I think of as a person having a panic attack. So uh, if you have a panic attack, you might even know you're having a panic attack, but you can't, you can't reason your way out of it. It doesn't work, right? Um, so in order to work with our dogs on reactivity, we have to work with them below that threshold, right? Because they're not going to learn good or bad up above threshold. Um, the other thing that's really important to understand that is that when your dog goes over threshold, all these stress hormones go through their body. And it takes about three days for all of those hormones to settle. So if you have a dog who's reacting every single day, your dog is probably never down at that bottom line. And what we want to do is we want to work with our dogs to minimize the number of reactions as much as possible because then they're going to have um, more resources to call upon when, the, when you're out working with them. Uh, if they're always hovering just below threshold, it's not going to take very much to boop, pop them right over and on, on, on we are with the, with the reaction. Um, so really important things to keep in mind. Um, and I think actually, if we've got questions right now, we could probably take it about these, these items. Sarah, we just have one question so far. Okay. Um, if this is from Susan, my dog runs up to people, cyclists, barking and growling when off lead, on lead, he rarely reacts. I keep him on lead, but if I do let him off, he does it. So <laughs> that's really funny because it's kind of the opposite of what most people experience. Uh, I think the vast majority of people experience uh, my dog's pretty good off leash with other dogs or people, but as soon as you put the leash on, they react. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a reversal. What I would um, tell you is that I think introductions to dogs and people are going to have to be done very, very carefully and not casually because that's something you're gonna to wanna to work on. There's obviously fear there um, that you'd need to address. Uh, and I don't know, you know, some of the work that, you, that we do with reactivity um, that we'll be doing tied to on-leash reactivity may actually, you could apply it in some of the cases um, that you're talking about. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, in the reactive dog class, we get a, the online class, we get into some of those things a, a bit, but a lot of it is going to be managing it, uh, making sure everyone's safe, um, creating positive associations with those people and dogs. Marnie, do you want to add something to that? Um, no, I don't actually have anything to add. I think yeah, you're covering all the big, points. It's a big question. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, any other questions? Um, we have uh, some comments. My dog reacts to sounds that I haven't even heard. Reaction seems instantaneous. Yep, uh, reaction we have sounds, yeah. We'll be, and we can touch upon that a bit, a little later. Yeah. Uh, my dog doesn't growl. He tries to bolt away so much that I just dislocated my knee. Whoa, okay. So, Hopefully um, you'll learn some things to help yeah, yeah. <laughs> today. From Denise, my dog barks, sometimes lunges at bikes, motorcycles, and skateboards, whether in the yard or on the leash. Fast moving things, very common trigger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, from Eric, more reactive on leash or along a fence. Okay. Yeah. Also common. Yep. Uh, Christina says she lives in an apartment complex where she can't control the distractions and her 10 pound dog is almost always over threshold. My vet suggested medicine. Thoughts? Let's postpone that question a bit because I think I, I would definitely, I think we would like to address that, but maybe we wait till we get a little further in and then uh, if, you, if uh, Liz, if you remember to 
bring it back. That would be sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, we have a lot more things being typed. So do you want to continue or look at some more comments? Um, I think we could probably go forward. Um, we're going to have plenty of opportunity to, to, to answer questions and we'll also have time at the end. So yeah, why don't we go ahead and go forward then? Yeah, and we may okay. preemptively answer some questions. That's what I'm thinking too, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, so we want to take a look at the science of training. Um, and we want to start by saying one of my favorite phrases, alpha schmalpha. Um, aside from being fun to say, it's um, also spot on. There's a lot of misinformation uh, in TV, on the internet, other media, that uh, a dog who's displaying the behavior that we see in a reactive dog is trying to be, air quotes, dominant, trying to take over your house and the world. And the fact is that they're not. As Sarah already touched on, uh, most dogs who demonstrate reactive behavior are fearful. And even though it's a big display, um, they're not trying to take over the world. So a lot of the um, dangerous and silly things that go along with that approach to understanding, you can just set aside. Um, and, and we'll be looking at ways to work with our dogs with that in mind. The, uh, the source of that uh, dominance theory, alpha dominance theory, is a study that was done in the 1930s and 40s with wolves who were captive and unrelated. So in just so many ways, it was not a natural situation. So what the wolves demonstrated was not what you would see in the wild. So it was flawed in that regard. The recording scientists for the study uh, recanted the study in the 70s or 80s and has been trying since then um, to get people to hear that. The other thing is that although wolves and dogs are genetically very close, um, behaviorally, they're quite different. Some, um, there are some very significant differences between wolves and dogs. Uh, just in particular, uh, dogs do not form stable packs. A wolf pack is generally a family group, the uh, breeding pair who are called the alpha pair um, because they're the breeding pair are the parents of the others in the pack. Uh, dogs will pack up for a purpose and dogs do have dog friends. I think even those of us with reactive dogs, some of us, our dogs have dog friends, but it's not that stable group that we see with wolves. So the good news is we can come to, to learn how our dogs work without being burdened with that. So some basic principles, uh, our dogs in many ways are smarter than we are. If something works, they will repeat it. If a behavior works, they'll repeat it. But if it doesn't, they won't. Uh, an example would be uh, an, um, the mail carrier comes and your dog just kind of goes through the roof and they're barking and they're lunging and they're growling and they're putting on this massive display and the mail carrier leaves and it works. The mail carrier comes the next day, your dog puts on that same display, the mail carrier leaves. From your dog's point of view, that behavior has been successful has been rewarded by the fact that the invader with the male has left every single time. So uh, an example of a behavior, how we might remove the reward from a behavior uh, would be a dog who jumps. Generally when a dog jumps, we'll go, no, stop it. And we'll look at them and we might push them down. And uh, for many dogs, that's the trifecta of reinforcement. We've looked at them, we've given them our attention and we've touched them. But if on the other hand, when a dog jumps, we don't do those things, we simply step aside and they, their um, paws, all four paws are on the floor and then we reward them. Um, we've removed the reward for the jumping and we've rewarded an incompatible behavior. So finally, even better is in a situation in which the dog would jump we're going to reward them before they do for still having their four paws on the floor. Um, and, and in that way, a dog can't have four paws on the floor and be jumping. So we've 
uh, rewarded the incompatible behavior. We've removed the reward from the behavior we don't want. So we're going to see less of what we don't want, more of what we do want. And as we move forward today, you'll see how that comes into play with alternative behaviors for our reactive dogs. So finally, we want to take a look at why punishment doesn't work. Answer number one, it doesn't teach our dogs what we do want. Imagine if you went to work and um, your employer, you did a thing that you thought you were supposed to do and your employer said no. And then you did another thing and your employer said no. And eventually you'd be afraid to do much of anything. But if your employer said, well, this is what I'd like, uh, then you know what your mission is. So, um, so punishment doesn't teach what we do want. It doesn't address the underlying cause of the behavior. It may shut down a symptom in the moment, uh, but it doesn't address the underlying cause. And so that um, underlying cause is gonna express itself either with the same behavior or it may come out in other behavior. Uh, punishment damages your relationship. If you have a reactive dog, if you have a dog, but um, with a reactive dog, especially with the element of fear, um, they need to know that you've got their back and that they can trust you. So we don't want to become the scary person who punishes our dog. We want them to know that they're safe with us. Um, and we want to build that strong relationship. And then finally, punishment can trigger aggression or it can create aggression where there was none. Um, that's a risk I don't want to take. That's a big reason not to use punishment. So let me move on to the next slide and then we can touch base about any questions we have about behavior and about expectations. So this follows on to, um, uh, to working with our dog's behavior. We want to have realistic expectations for a reactive dog. Expectation number one, and um, you know, full disclosure, I uh, spent 12 lovely years with a dog who was quite dog reactive, not to mention skateboards and um, people in uniform. Uh, so these things were true for him. Uh, the management which means setting our dogs up to succeed, minimizing their exposure to the things that set them off, and training, which is in a measured way, helping our dogs build uh, better emotions surrounding the things that worry them now, as well as uh, building powerful alternative behaviors. Those have become a natural part of my life with my dog and my dog's life. Um, that said, we can look forward to our dog being able to walk down the street with another dog, person, jogger, bicycle, skateboard, et cetera, across the street. That's a reasonable and a realistic expectation and goal. Can you get farther? Perhaps, uh, but, but this is a, a good, um, good benchmark to set. And then finally, there are appropriate and inappropriate environments for my dog. Um, an appropriate environment um, would be on a trail or in a park where you can uh, see, or see who's there pretty easily so that you can help your dog if it looks like things might become challenging and you can set your dog up for success. Inappropriate environment, Saturday morning in a farmer's market where everybody and his dog is there or everybody and her dog are there and uh, generally paying more attention to the fruits and vegetables and other farmer's goods than to the dog. That's not a, uh, an environment for success. So any questions at this point on behavior, the rules of behavior and our expectations? Marnie, we have a lot of comments in the chat box. Okay. Um, so, what I'll do is just kind of scroll down and yeah, right. give you the next question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nancy asked, would you suggest not walking your dog for a couple of days to get him to relax and then try walking and keeping below threshold? Mine reacts in every walk, so it's, is it best to take a break and then go from there? I think taking a break is a great idea, Nancy. 
I, um, you know, hats off to you for thinking of that, especially if, um, if you're able to create mental exercise in your home and if you have a yard so your dog can take care of elimination needs um, there, I think that's a great idea. Let them decompress and then, um, you know, use some of the techniques that we'll be looking at today to help set them up for success the next time. Uh, then from Perry, we have, if your dog immediately sits down when they see another dog, is that reactive behavior? I see Sarah nodding. Sarah, you take this one. <laughs> you know, it's not what we typically think of as reactive. We, re we really think more of a big display. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of dogs, when they're worried about something, um, will do that. And so I think if that's the case, then, then the techniques that we use to work with uh, the, the more typical reactivity will actually help with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. From Julia, uh, this is a good one. Can my reactive dog play with other dogs ever or does he have to be kept isolated? And, and this is where we give you that most hated of dog training answers, which is, it depends. <laughs> Some reactive dogs um, have dog friends and some reactive dogs really don't much want to know other dogs. Uh, so, so the answer would be maybe. I would say once you've you know, done some of these things and backed off, you know, kind of your dogs decompress, they're not all full of stress hormones all the time, they're a little bit easier in the neighborhood, um, you might begin to see your dog take note of another dog in a way that's not on guard, that's not reactive. And then maybe, you know, you could begin to, to look at um, um, really slowly raising the possibility of being with other dogs. This next question, I think is, it fits in well with what you've been talking about from Judith. Why does the leash cause the lunging barking um, rather than when they're off lead? So um, I'm just looking ahead for where we're going. So I'll give you the quick answer, um, Judith, and then we're gonna take some time to be looking at the leash today. The um, leash, the pressure of the leash triggers what we call um, the opposition reflex or the oppositional response. There's some indication that it might not be a true reflex, but regardless, when we tug on the leash, our dogs tug the other way. It's what vertebrates do. That backward pressure causes the dog to move forward more fully. And the dog pulling forward causes us to pull back more fully. So we get into this tug of war, uh, that puts a lot of physical and um, emotional behavioral stress on the situation. That backward tug can actually trigger an aggressive response and is used in, um, in some approaches to teaching uh, dogs for protection. So, um, so not a thing we wanna do. Off leash, your dog knows that their options are not limited in the same way. And um, um, off leash, they are not getting that body pressure. They're able to move away, you know, and they know when they're, on, I mean, they know very well when they're on a leash. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you got to do something to make yourself feel, feel safe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is about equipment and I think you'll be coming up to that, right? Yeah. Let's hold off on that. Yeah. Okay. So that's a good segue into moving forward, I think. Yeah. Why don't we do that? And, and uh, don't worry though, we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so the first thing we want to introduce to you is something, uh, a technique called click for looking. Uh, and click for looking is really, I think of it as like, it's the workhouse, <laughs> or workhorse, excuse me, of the, the training that we do with, with reactive dogs. It's, de it's designed to, on one hand, create positive associations between the things that trigger our dog's reactivity um, so that those things come to um, mean good things. 
So that's going to be one thing. And it's also going to let your dog what, what you want them to do and what they can do um, to help themselves. So um, for those of you who've never used a clicker, uh, the picture here is an example of a, a clicker. There are different types out there. They all work the same way. Uh, there's a button on it, you push it, and it makes a clicking noise. Easy enough. Um, and the idea is that we use a clicker to mark the moment our dog does the thing we want them to do, and then we follow it with a treat each and every time. We never want to click without treating. Even if we click by accident, we still give the treat. And we'll, we all click by accident, it happens. Um, so um, the thing to understand then, what we're doing with Click for Looking is we are rewarding our dogs for looking at the trigger, the dog or the person or the bicycle, whatever it is, and not reacting. Okay. Um, so I, I, the moment my dog looks, so I, my dog, uh, my last dog was very dog reactive. And the way I worked with her is I, the moment that she saw a dog, I would click and I'd give her a treat. She'd look back and I click and I give her a treat and we do it over and over again. We're going to show you a video of what this looks like. Um, so what, what's going to happen over time is my dog's going to look, hear the click, get a treat. Uh, and, and eventually my dog's going to start to anticipate that. So, oh, there's a dog, right? Um, and it has the ability then to teach my dog that thing's good because a click and treat's coming. I'm going to look at my person because I'm going to get my treat. And then you're, the, the thing that was so scary has turned in a cue into a cue to look at you, which is very, very powerful because then you can do all sorts of things. All right. So I think if we show this video, Marnie, um, it will make all of this much clearer. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so now what we'd like to do is show you another technique. We'll click for looking. And the reason we're moving to this next step is because when we were working on counter conditioning with Flynn, uh, we're noticing that when he looked at Dave, he was starting to look back towards Marnie on his own. And that's telling us that he's making that connection between Dave and something really fabulous coming from Marnie. Um, and so click for looking is, is uh, we use a clicker for this. And the basic idea with the clicker is that it's used to mark a behavior, behavior that we like. And a click is always, always, always followed by a reward. And so what we're going to be doing is when Flint Flam looks at Dave, he's going to get a click and a treat. And the idea is you can look at that dog and then check back in with me. Um, and if we do this really consistently, anytime he sees a dog, he's going to very quickly check right back in with Marty. Um, so are you, are you ready to go ahead? I'm ready. I've got my clicker and my leash hand. I've got my leash by my side so that it can be loose, but he doesn't have so much leash that he can get very far ahead of me. Right, so my you'll, cheese. Yeah, you will notice Marty's always right up by his shoulder. A lot of times we get caught too far behind yeah. uh, the dog, and your dog's not paying any attention. So that way, she's right there and ready to go. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and bring Dave out. And at the second that Flynn Flynn sees Dave, he gets a click. Oops, should I keep him on the opposite? Yeah, side? that's a great. Or it doesn't matter. <laughs> he was fine with that. Oh, it was <laughs> yeah, okay. it as much. yeah. He knows this game. <laughs> so he's gotten a little more used to Dave as we've worked. Oh, look at you. Look at you. So every single time he looks, he gets a click. Really? Is he maybe getting tired of you? It's new cheese. Oh. And that's nice. Very nice. Look at that, he's looking away. I think he liked the other cheese a little better. Okay, so why don't we take a break and I'll switch back to the other cheese if I still have some. Okay, so we'll take the cheese back. And then go ahead. He would prefer fresh, but know the other, he has preferences. Mm -hmm. All right, yes. 
So I'm going to get loaded again. A lot of cheese. In my hands. I'm just putting several slices in my hands and I'm delivering it, just squeezing it out just a little bit as if my hands a human squeeze too little at a time. Okay. okay let's okay. go again. Okay. I think so same setup. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So oh. <laughs> There's water being consumed. Okay, we're ready to go. Whenever you there are. Comes Dave. Yeah. Here we go. And Flynn's getting cooked. Dave. That was a snort with the cheese, by the way. Yeah, not a part. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so if you're if you have this opportunity, you can see that you're getting in lots of clicks for looking. It's yeah. not just one click. And you're done with the training. It's looking over and over again, getting clicked each time. And I'm to go ahead. Go ahead. I'm delaying a little bit more before I click to see if he'll do exactly what he just did, which is to look at Dave and look back at me. Sounds like he's learning. It does. Yeah. You want to try and forward? Yeah. So when we go a little bit closer, he's doing so well. One little step. Yeah. We do. Yeah, you can see now he's a little bit more aroused, looking back at me a little bit less. Nobody oh, is finding the cheese on the floor. Mm -hmm. Sneak peek. <laughs> you thought I didn't see that. And you can now see that when you click, his head comes right around. When you first started, when you clicked, yeah. He didn't really look away. Um, and I'm right. almost out of cheese. So that's a great place to stop anyway. He's having good success. He's looking for increased periods of time. Okay, find it. Good boy. And now he's cleaning up on my dropped cheese. Okay. Nice job. All right. So I think I'm going to be able to head off some of the questions that you're having right now. Um, but we'll stop in a little bit and take some. Um, so click for looking. I think um, a lot of questions come around, what if my dog's reacting? Do I still click? Um, here's the thing. So remember we talked about how it's important to work with our dogs when they're below threshold. If your dog barks, they're over threshold. If you were if you were to accidentally click when they when they barked, it really wouldn't matter that much. They're not going to um, it's not going to mean much. So you know, if you happen to click when they bark, the world won't end. If you consistently went from bark click treat bark click treat bark click treat, then you might have a problem. <laughs> okay, um, but here's the thing: distance is critical it is so crucial to your success you have to be far enough away from the trigger that they're not going to react you want to catch them when they're looking not reacting your click has to come quickly because the longer they look the the you know odds are they may rev up and react um and so you'll notice how when marnie was working with flim flam there she was clicking the second that he looked right no, no waiting around. That's one thing. How far you need to be away is going to depend on your dog, right? Um, some dogs, you know, it's a football field away and they'll, they'll, you know, they're on the edge of reacting. Some of you, it might be, you know, I don't know, much, much less, you know, um, three houses down, say. Right. So it, it's you have to kind of figure out what's going to work for your dog. Where do they where can they be and, and not lose it and still look at that trigger. And that's where you're working. Um, I, I saw passing by someone asked how far away was Dave in this. Um, and I'm terrible at like feet or whatever. Um, but he, he was far enough away that we couldn't get him onto the video. <laughs> Right. <laughs> but the other thing to understand is um, with Flim Flam, Marnie had been working with him for years. So, you know, she could be much closer to Dave, at, you know, in, at this point than when she first started working with him. Um, the, not only you get you get better with the training, but so does your dog. Your dog understands, oh, we're doing that again. Okay, good. 
um, and that predictability really helps them. Yeah. So something to keep in mind. Um, and finally, the treats that you use matter very much. I can't emphasize that one enough. I, uh, I constantly hear people say, oh yeah, my dog loves Cheerios. Oh, they love Cheerios. I am here to tell you they don't love Cheerios that much. I, I, it would be the odd dog, let's, let's put it that way. Um, we're talking, you know, Marnie in this video is using cheese, um, lean meats, like little pieces of chicken or turkey, very healthy, um, little tiny pieces. Uh, those are the kinds of things I, I usually look at. Um, oh, I don't know, Marnie, what else do you tend to use for treats? Oh, um, oh I really go overboard. Uh, I use, <laughs> you do. I do, I do. You want to be my dog. Um, I use Italian meatballs, uh, chicken liver, beef liver, and this is like actual liver that I cook, um, as well as some of the dehydrated uh, Boy, cheese has always been a hot seller in my house, and I'm fortunate to have dogs who tolerate cheese. Um, so we use cheese. I use salmon cream cheese. Uh, that's just kind of off the top of my head. Oh, baby food. As Peanut well. butter. And we'll be talking about how you can possibly use those things. Yeah. Um, we can talk about that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so it matters a great deal. And I've worked with people where they try this on their own, it doesn't work. And then I hand them some rotisserie chicken and oh, wow, it really does work. <laughs> um, so you've got to make it worth your dog's while. Will you need that for the rest of your dog's life on every walk? No. But in the early training phases, you absolutely need something really, really good to, to help them. Okay. Um, you'll notice too, when Marnie was working with Flim Flam, when we said, um, okay, let's move a little closer, she took a minuscule sized step forward. Our dogs are very, very visual. So, you know, even a regular sized step is probably too much. You're working in tiny increments. So you start really far away. And then as they get more comfortable, I can start to close in the distance. The other thing to know is that at no point did Marnie ask Flim Flam to sit? And I think that's what a lot of people do is they ask their dogs to sit I think because it makes us feel more in control. But if you think about it, asking um, someone who's uh, anxious and worried to sit down, it's putting them in an even more vulnerable position. Uh, and at one point in the video, and you can see it in this uh, photo here, Flim Flam chose to sit down. And that was great because that gave us information. Okay, he's comfortable enough, he's sitting, right? So uh, let your dog choose the posture that they want. That's gonna be really important as well. Um, but the most important thing I can get across with this is that we're not distracting them, we're rewarding them for looking. That is so critical. That's how you're gonna change your dog's emotions and um, make real progress. Will there be times when you need to distract them? Absolutely, and we're gonna be getting on, um, moving to that uh, in a little bit of ways to do that really effectively. But this is the thing that's gonna really change how your dog sees those triggers uh, in the future. Marnie, do you want anything before I, we jump forward? Just one thing, um, just going back to your talking about how I never asked um, Flim to sit, um, but he chose to sit. I wonder if anybody noticed toward the end of the video when we stepped closer, it was about six inches closer he and he chose to remain standing. He didn't yep. sit again. Yeah, so exactly. that, that as well was information. He said, I can handle it, but you know, I'm not gonna be sitting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a good point. Yeah, okay. All right, why don't we hop ahead to the next slide then? All right. Okay. Sadly, not everybody has a Dave and a training center at their disposal. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you can't do this. You absolutely can do this. Um, and in fact, my reactive girl, I never worked with her in a setup like that. Okay, I worked out in the real world. Uh, I created my own training setups in the real world uh, instead of um, you know doing it like what we showed you. That was largely largely. Um, I mean, it can be useful if you can arrange something like that, but it's not necessary. Okay, um, so you've got to 
part of your success is going to be, can you come up with a way to practice this uh, in an environment where you can have some control over the distance and the intensity of the trigger, okay? Um, because getting caught off guard all the time is going to make it really hard to do this well, right? Um, will, will you be 100%? No. You know, the world isn't that kind to us. <laughs> Things are going to sneak up on us. But you can really minimize it by quite a lot. Um, as I mentioned, food quality is important and choosing posture. So as far as setups go, um, I will tell you, uh, let me tell you a little bit about how I uh, worked with my dog. And then Marnie worked in a really urban environment. So I'm going to let Marnie, when we get to that, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about yeah. that. Because I'm sure we have people here who are dealing with that, you know, people living in close quarters with lots of dogs yeah. and people and, and stuff. Um, so with my own dog, when I started working with her, I could not walk in my neighborhood without a reaction was not possible. I couldn't be far enough away. Um, and after trying for a little while, I'm like, well, this isn't working. Um, so I decided to, every time I took her for a walk, hop in the car, I drove two minutes away, three minutes away, depending on the light, <laughs> um, to a park. And there was a lot of open space in the park. And the great thing is I could walk around and I was, no one was ever sneaking up on me, right? Because I could always see things. And then I could choose how close do I want to get to this dog? Or do I need to back up? Or are they coming right at me? Do I need to move in another direction? It allowed me to maneuver and, um, and work things out that way. Once I had practiced there for, for a decent amount of time, I, I would say it was probably a couple months before I, I felt like, okay, now we're really on a roll. I went back into the neighborhood and I did just fine. Um, but it was too hard at first. I needed to have more distance. So you may need to alter where you're walking. It's not forever, it's for now. Um, but other possibilities, you could train from um, right at your front door, right? You might be able to, if you have a glass door, you could even be inside if you wanted or just outside with your dog on a leash. Uh, at times when whatever your dog's trigger is, is going to be most likely to go by. Um, you can do it from inside your car. Uh, and you see in this photo, I love this photo. This is one of, um, one of the people who took our online reactive dog class and she, she sent us this photo and she worked with her dog in the car looking, and I think it's a pet supply store off in the distance. Um, and that worked really, really well for her. Um, and so, yeah, and so outside a pet, a pet supply store or a, at a vet, either in the car or even out of the car could work. Marnie, why don't you talk a little bit about urban environment? Sure. So I live in suburban Virginia, probably one of the few neighborhoods when people see you coming with a dog, they cross the street or let you cross the street. Um, so, so it's been a great place to be with uh, environmentally sensitive dogs. But I was moving to Toronto, going to be living in the city. And, you know, it's dense and it's really dog friendly. You can take your dog on the um, metro in Toronto. So dogs everywhere. And when I arrived, I began to walk the neighborhood where I would be walking with my dog, but without my dog and imagining what's, what am I going to do if there's a dog that comes around that corner? Um, and at, at this time, Flim Flam was not the dog you saw in that video. He was really, really, you know, short, um, um, you know, really close to threshold all the time. So I really needed to strategize. So I had escape routes down alleys. There were places to jump behind um, structures or where cars were usually parked. And I practiced without him three times everywhere that I expected to go with him. So when I was walking with him, I had the muscle memory that I needed to be able to support him when triggers appeared. Um, use some of the techniques that you'll see that we're gonna look at um, uh, today, but in particular, I already had a plan before I was out there with Flynn, um, you know, with triggers. Yeah, you know, I think some of the times when we talk about this stuff, it, people sort of think, oh my gosh, this is so much work. But remember, it's, it's a process, it's not forever. 
it's a temporary, you know, it's going to get better as you work with them. Yeah. But if you're willing to really go the extra length now, you're going to get to your end result much, much faster. Yeah. So, so taking that time to walk you know, the neighborhood multiple times can make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to show the next couple of slides, Marnie? We can show some good training setups yeah. and not so great training setups. So this is what Marnie and I call a hot zone. <laughs> Something <laughs> yes, to be avoided. So um, this is on uh, one of my walks. Uh, I would be a fool when I was working with my reactive dog to walk over that bridge because <laughs> I have no idea what's on the other side. And in fact, I do know on the other side is very, very narrow. So there would be really no easy escape pattern. So this is the kind of thing where I'm, I have to maybe change my walking route a little bit to avoid stuff like this so that I don't get myself in trouble. Let me show you something that looks a lot more successful. Okay, so this is in a park. Um, and if you follow the path, all the way down and up that goes up some stairs there where Marnie's pointing with the cursor. Um, there's a, there's actually a dog park up there, but the great thing is from here, you can't see the dog park cause it's behind foliage and various stuff. Um, but I can see dogs going, uh, coming and going, uh, to the dog park. So there's a person, you can see a person right there where Marnie's circling. They're coming out of the dog park and they're walking over to the parking lot, which is way off to the left, right? It's actually mostly off the, the photo. <laughs> but there's a, there's a relatively steady stream, depending on time of day, going from the parking lot to the dog park and back again. Um, I am standing up. It's on a bit of a hill, as I think you can tell. I could move further away than this. Uh, if I wanted to, I could move closer if I wanted to. And around me is mostly open space. I have to keep a little eye out to make sure that off off on the distance, you know, there isn't a dog that comes. But, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to manage. Um, so that's the kind of thing, you know, looking for paths where people walk their dogs and setting yourself back away from them, um, or just people walking by or places where um, kids skateboard or something like that is finding places where you can look at it from a distance and remember you over time then you're going to gradually be able to close in your distance so maybe we take questions now anybody so uh, Liz yes um, I'll, I'll continue going down the list um, we did have I noticed we have a, a bunch of questions about um, dogs being over threshold and how do you um, keep them or what do you do to keep them under threshold? Um, that's kind of a general theme that I see in some of the questions and I think you talked a little bit about that. It's all about distance. Yeah. It's all about lowering the intensity of that trigger um, and so in order for it to be less intense, it needs to be further away. Yeah. And that's why we're talking about these setups is how can you be further away? And the, the other question that's related to that is about um, from Rebecca, her dog's usually very calm and non-responsive, but if he sees another dog, even from a window, he will sometimes lunge and bark. So he's still stressed even during those times when he's away from the stimuli. So I guess, I, am I understanding it, the, the dogs in a wind, in a window in a house you're going by? Am I that's what it, that's what it sounds like. So and I can, yeah, so I can do the same thing. I can work on the same thing. And the great thing about that is that's a setup. If you know there's a house, you know, three houses down, there's this dog that's always barking out the window every time you walk by with your dog, I can start to approach it and ideally 
I might even start clicking and treating for your, your dog looking at the house because a lot of dogs will remember which houses have dogs, right? And they're right. going to start to worry a little bit. And I can start that game of clicking and looking for just looking at the house. And then I might creep closer, maybe close enough to um, that, you know, the dog makes an appearance. If I can, I'm going to continue and click for looking. I might have to click and treat looking at the house for a while before I'm able to do that. I might not be able to get past the house in the beginning. I might just have to walk kind of towards it and then go back a different direction for a little while until I can work up to that point. Um, but that's, that's a setup if ever there were one. Uh, I, I've worked with those many times. Um, I worked with a, <laughs> my dog with dogs that were behind a fence that always barked at her. And it was great. It was like such great practice. And then one day they boarded up the front of the fence. So I was like, Oh, my setup. Oh, darn. Yeah. <laughs> so you should really, your, your head should change a lot when you work with your dog. You're like, Oh good. A training opportunity instead of, Oh no, a trigger. Yeah. Uh, we had some questions about the clicker. Yeah. So I wanted to circle back on those. Um, one individual has a dog um, who is deaf. Yeah. So, so obviously the clicker is not going to help with that. Okay. And what, uh, anything else about clicker? Uh, yes. Uh, can you use a tongue clicking noise instead of a manual clicker? Okay, let me, yeah, okay, let me go talk about these things and it might head off some of the other ones. Um, for the deaf dog, there, there are different ways of marking good behavior. So Marnie and I really like clickers. It's a distinct sound. It sounds like nothing else so that when my dog hears it, they know, oh, I did the right thing, here comes my treat. And it really stands out M more. Um, there are people who will use something like a tongue click um, which I think if you've got a good one, it, it can work for sure. Um, some people who will use a word like, yes, something like that. Those things are okay. Um, but I would say if you can try the clicker, at least for the beginning of your training, it's really worth it because it's, it's so precise and your timing can be so good once you get over the awkward feeling of working with the clicker in the beginning. There's a little bit of a learning curve. Be patient with yourself. I laugh when people say, I'm too uncoordinated to use a clicker. And I say, can you drive a car? Because <laughs> I promise you, <laughs> using a clicker is easier. Um, but with a deaf dog, I've done different things. Um, you know, a lot of people with a deaf dog will use a visual as the marker. It's a little hard with a reactive dog because their attention is on something else. But if you can be in there, if you can get yourself positioned so that you're close enough um, a lot of people do like a thumbs up. Um, some people I've known, some people to use a little light that they can shine. Um, thumbs up can, I think is easier. Uh, I actually worked with one deaf dog um, where we just lightly tapped and gave a treat. And we practiced, you know, tap the dog, give a treat, tap the dog, give a treat when there are no triggers. And then we're, you know, worked up to it. Marnie, what do, have you had experience with deaf dogs? Um, I have, um, and, uh, um, you know, I like the tap because it can be really meaningful um, to a dog. And, and I think it can, if it's positively trained, it can cut through the same way that a clicker can. Yeah. Um, but also with deaf dogs, um, we have simply fed in the moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, in that very moment. It requires, uh, you know, some, some really good manual skills on the part of the handler. But, but if the food happens immediately, that helps as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of that is then your position next to your dog when you're working on this is that you're yeah. up yeah. near their sh shoulder, up close to their head. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Peripheral yeah. vision. And, um, yeah. Um, what was I? I was going to say something else about a clicker. And I, oh, there are some dogs who are deathly afraid of the sound of the click. It doesn't yeah. happen often, but it does happen. Um, there are ways, in some cases, you can kind of desensitize them to it by starting it, you know, with it muffled. Oh, I don't, I've done it where I've wrapped it up in paper towels and put it in my pocket. And so it was really muffled. And then I worked up to a regular, you know, louder sound. For some dogs though, it becomes, it's just not, it's not a tolerable sound. Uh, there's something about the frequencies. Um, and in which case that, that's when I would go to another type of marker, you know, 
I've even had people say click <laughs> and that actually works pretty well. I'll put there, are few more, there are a few more clicker questions if you're game. No, I'm game. Um, is there an average amount of time clicker training is used before the dog doesn't have to be reliant on it? And then kind of a uh, partner question is, you would need to eat the clicker with you all the time? Okay. So the important thing to understand about clicker training is that the clicker is temporary right? It's a way of teaching a, a new behavior. Um, what I found with, uh, what I find with a lot of clients is we start with the clicker and then we pretty quickly <clears throat> are able to shift over to something like a, a marker word or sound. Yep. Or whatever, you know, whatever you choose. Um, something that consistently means basically the same thing. Um, and how quickly you can do that oh my gosh, it's like an impossible question to answer, I'm afraid, because it's so extremely variable. Um, but once they kind of understand the game of this is what we do when we see that trigger, you're going to be able to get rid of the clicker. Um, don't be in a hurry, <laughs> but understand that it's not forever. It absolutely is not forever. Did I answer everything in that? Uh, yes, I think. And then, then a follow-up question from Jody is, my dog does great with the clicker and treat until we get outside and then he doesn't even hear it. Yeah, so that's, a, so when you, if you click and your dog doesn't hear it, that's really because your dog's over threshold or pretty darn close over threshold. Um, and so if I, if I click when my dog looks at that trigger, and my dog doesn't even register it, then that's telling me I, I'm a little too close. Now, if your dog is like that, whenever they step outside, I would, I would try to work um, on some really simple training things that you've done with them inside to see if you can get them giving you more attention. Um, Marnie, uh, along with uh, one of our colleagues, Susan Sanderson did a, a webinar not long ago here on attention games. Uh, and that might be worth looking at. It'll give you ideas of things that you could practice with your dog first inside and then outside. So, you know, with all of our training, we start in low distraction environment and move to that high distraction. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not unlike us where if we have to, if we're learning something new, we have to be able to focus. But once we get good at it, it's not that big a deal. We can do it. And our dogs are the same way. Okay. And another one from Jennifer, which I think is uh, similar, is the idea to also click for looking if the dog is under threshold. If my dog is over threshold upon leaving our apartment, will clicking while looking work? Probably not. So hold that thought because I think okay. we'll have some ideas for you coming up. A nice segue. <laughs> it is kind of a nice segue. <laughs> Why don't we go forward and we can, we can still take some of these questions um, later on. Yeah. 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 Sounds good. Okay. Um, so I would just want to show you this, this graphic. I think it might help you think a little bit about these setups and, you know, when, when's a good time to work with your dog and when is it time to just um, get yourself out of a situation, which we'll be talking about more shortly. Um, training in the success zone. So we have our dog and we have the scary monster off to the right, which is the, that's the dog's trigger. And remember, that's probably how your dog thinks about the trigger. <laughs> um, so at, at the first point, my dog notices the scary monster. Uh, the second point, my dog becomes very concerned about the scary monster. And at the third point, the closest point, uh, my dog is terrified by the scary monster. And if you look underneath, we have um, the green zone, which is where we we're doing this work, um, counter conditioning, essentially, uh, you know, essentially click for looking. We're working on creating this good association. Look at the thing, get a treat. Look at the thing, get a treat. Look at the thing, get a treat. As, as my dog becomes very concerned about the scary monster, that's when I'm going to be thinking, hmm, I might need to move away. Uh, I might need more distance. 
um, some signs that your dog is becoming very concerned. Uh, your dog was hearing a click and then suddenly stops hearing the click. Your dog starts to take uh, treats out of your hand like it's a velociraptor. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, uh, tension in their body language. Um, you know, so you, uh, with time, I think if you're really looking, you'll be able to s begin to see things um, that indicate, uh oh, my dog's starting to get a little too stressed. And that's yellow, beware, I'm getting too close, now it's time to move away. And then when we hit dog terrified, it's that's my dog reacting. And uh, um, we really wanna try to avoid that whenever we possibly can. Um, so you might kind of keep this schematic in your head when you're out and about with your dog and you're working with them, is kind of figuring out where, where you are. Um, one thing to know is that this, this is uh, a lovely drawing where the, the points are equidistant. <laughs> in real life, you may have a gigantic red zone, an eensy teensy yellow zone, and an even eensy teensier green zone, right? Um, that's pretty normal, honestly. <laughs> Um, hopefully over time that's going to shift so that you've got more area to work in. Uh, but you know, it's going to be different for every dog. Uh, but I think usually you can kind of find these things. All right. Okay. We should go ahead and move forward then Marnie. Let's do. So I've been noticing, um, in chat when I've been able to look at chat, there are a lot of questions about what do I do when things aren't working, when we're stuck, when we're too close? So we have a couple of techniques uh, that will help you get out of Dodge. And the first one or the first two are, so I guess we have a few techniques. The first two are the backup recall and the U-turn. The video is pretty much self-explanatory. So I'm gonna go ahead and play it and um, then we'll come back. and show you some leash handling skills uh, that you are going to be able to use with your dog. The important thing about all of these things is that you practice them first at times when they're relaxed and calm, um, not looking at something scary. The more you practice, the more it becomes kind of like muscle memory, um, and then you'll be ready for the, the moment when you really need it. So the first one we're going to show is the backup recall. Backup recall. All right. So Sarah's going to engage with Flim Flam, who's already staged at her feet. He adores her. And I'm going to um, get his attention using a cue. Um, pop, pop, pop is the one that works for me. So I'm going to slide just a little closer. Pop, 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 pop. Good boy. Yes. Nice. Nice. Going to send him back. We're going to do it again. Okay. Go say hi. Uh -huh. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Yes. Nice job. Nice job. All right. So you can see how that would help um, a situation where you need to get your dog back paying attention to you or potentially getting them to move uh, so you can continue on in the opposite direction. Yeah. Uh, and the idea is to make it as fun as possible so that your dog actually wants to do that. Okay, so if you uh, find yourself again way far away from your dog and you want to put yourself between your dog and the trigger, this is the technique you'd use. Go say hi. Yes. So again, all the way back, walking hand over hand to his shoulder. Yes, back in his radar. And now I'm putting food at his nose and I'm walking, yeah, goodbye, here we go. I'm walking away next to him. You saw I put myself between Flim Flam and Sarah, the better to remove his attention from Sarah. Let's do that again. All right. Flim Flam, go say hi. Yes, good boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I've dropped all sorts of food here. All right. Okay. So again, I'm all the way away. If he's pulling toward a trigger, then the leash is going to be really taut. Hand over hand to his shoulder. I'm matching the pressure, but I'm not adding pressure. Let's go away. Oh my goodness. Let's go. Good dog. Good dog. 
So one thing you might keep in mind is that if you have a dog who, who um, redirects when they get upset, so a dog who sees something scary and might actually turn and nip or bite at you, I wouldn't put myself between my dog and the other right, dog. Right, right, right. And you want to yeah. make sure you have enough distance yeah. so that it's safe. But yes, it, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So um, as Sarah said in the video, uh, you know, if if your dog redirects you, that's probably not the technique for you. But the backup recall um, works really well. Couple of notes. Um, obviously, you are not going to let your dog go all the way up to the trigger. We did a setup here in which Sarah was getting Flim's attention to, um, you know, kind of simulate what it would be like with a dog pulling towards something that perhaps he's not as happy to see. Although you can use this if your dog is over eager to meet someone the same way that if your dog's pulling toward a trigger, uh, you stop the forward motion as I did in the video, gather up the leash as you walk hand over hand to his shoulder and um, then either uh, initiate the backup recall with the happy, happy um, you know, repeated prompt or uh, do the U-turn if your dog is not a dog who redirects. Something that you wanna practice when nothing is happening. <laughs> you wanna practice it just as a fabulous game uh, so that when your dog uh, hears the cue, they're like, oh my gosh, we're playing that fabulous game again. The moment that our dogs are reacting, that is not a training point. That's a point where you wanna have already trained this so you can use it to get out of that situation. I'm gonna go on to one more um, technique that we use to get out of trouble. And then we'll um, take a look at some questions then. And this next technique, um, this is so shockingly simple, but it is so powerful to help our dogs when they're in challenging situations. It's find it. I bet that you know, many of you already play some version of this. So the way we like to apply it in this situation, you call out, find it, toss a treat on the floor or the ground where it's easy for your dog to do so. The moment she finishes the treat, you say, find it again and toss a treat. This is not about your dog giving you attention. So you're not gonna be going um, Fido, find it and expect Fido to look at you first before you uh, initiate find it. If they're doing so, that's fine. But um, you really want to use find it to guide your dog's focus down. And uh, as you'll see in the video, you can also use it to move your dog to you, to move your dog with you, and to move your dog away from a thing. So anytime you initiate the find it game, do it at least seven times in quick succession. That will make this a really, really powerful tool really fast. Um, so let me go ahead and play a video. So I had been bringing him to me, now I'm moving him away. Find it. Could use this to guide him away from a trigger. Find it. Find it. Find it. And if we really need to get out of Dodge, we can use this to move rapidly out of the way. Okay, let's see. So any questions about the U-turn, backup recall, gathering up the leash or find it? These are all um, techniques that we can use, um, you know, individually and in, in sequence as necessary to um, move our dogs away before they react. That's our preferred thing to do. 
Um, we want to set them up to be able to process their triggers successfully. And if they can't, then we want to get out of the situation. Somebody, I just saw a com comment fly by, pardon me for intervening, but Marty, yeah, the question is, what's the purpose of find it? Um, the purpose of find it is to move your dog around in a way that does not put pressure on them, that has the positive emotional um, aspect of having been trained as a fun game. Uh, and you can use it to draw your dog's attention to you without asking them to hold a static position that can add stress in the situation as I did at the beginning, bringing my dog to my pink shoes. Um, and you know, that really, you saw how it really focused him around my feet. So if, if we're stuck, that might be the way, step off a path, do that until the challenge passes, uh, use it to guide my dog as I move um, forward um, and, or use it to move my dog away from a thing. So that's the, the function, the reason we use find it. It also has um, one side effect if there's another dog in the environment who might be a little reactive and thinking your dog looks a mite suspicious, uh, cueing your dog to play a game where they are sniffing the ground and um, uh, you know, not looking at the other dog actually sends a message to the other dog, oh, I mean you no harm because a dog who wants to send a message that I don't mean you any harm will sometimes choose to sniff the ground. And then finally, uh, sniffing itself is calming for our dogs. The heart rate goes down when they do that. It takes them a little bit further away from um, that stress point. Okay, were there any other questions that we wanted to touch on that Liz or Sarah that you saw? I just happened to see that fly by. I just wanted to make sure that everybody got it. <laughs> well, I got, yeah, you know, and, and usually somebody asks that question. So we're appreciative. Yeah. Um, you know, because it uh, just looks a, like a game. Yeah, go ahead. There was another question about what if another dog runs up to get the treat? So um, hopefully you don't have an off-leash dog. That's a great point. Um, you're going to choose what you use in the situation. Let's say it's an off-leash dog. And so you go, oh my gosh, I'm really not going to be doing find it. That's not going to go well. This is not something I would do if, um, if my dog were around off-leash dogs. Um, in, in that situation, I would probably do a U-turn backup recall get the heck out of there. Thanks, that was it on the find it questions oh, that I great. can see. Great, okay. All right, we will move on then. And you know, not your last chance for questions. We'll certainly have time at the end. We wanted to change gear a little bit and take a look at gear, change gears and look at gear. Um, we like to, put our dogs in harnesses, especially if they are reactive dogs. Uh, a collar, uh, you know, even a flat collar or martingale puts pressure on the throat. And if your dog's having a reactive moment, they're pulling forward, uh, it can cut off the airway, it risks injury to the, um, to the delicate organs and, uh, and glands in the throat. And the, uh, the stress from the discomfort can actually increase the stress hormone in your dog's system and take them closer to threshold. So a couple of things that we look for in harnesses. Uh, on the left is a T-Touch Harmony harness, which frees the dog's shoulders. This is my personal go-to when it's a good fit for the dog, because I like being able to free the dog's shoulders. It also, and this is key, you can clip a double-ended leash to the front and back of the harness, which uh, even if the dog pulls, tends to keep them more in physical balance, which can contribute to behavioral balance because they're not kind of um, you know, off kilter. It also gives us more influence because we can uh, use the double-ended leash to move our dogs in a way that's fairly gentle or to prevent their forward movement. Uh, in a way that is much more comfortable for them than if it were on a flat collar. On the right is a freedom harness, also a good choice. It also has uh, the opportunity or the option of clipping 
to the front and back both. This strap goes over the top of their shoulders just a little bit. So the shoulders are not completely free. In the great scheme of things, um, that may be a, a minor consideration unless your dog uh, pulls a whole lot all the time. And um, for some round chested dogs, the Freedom Harness can be a better fit. We have some links here for you to follow at your leisure. Um, one to the T-Touch Harmony Harness, one to the Freedom Harness. If you're local to um, the Washington DC and Rockville area, you can actually get either of them through your dog's friend. Uh, there is another harness that we don't have um, a photo of. It's called the Perfect Fit Modular Harness. If you have a dog who's tricky to fit for a harness, it's worth keeping in mind because for the perfect fit harness, you measure each of three parts separately to create a nearly custom fit for the harness. Also, the perfect fit people are happy to give you advice um, and may offer some solutions that are even a little bit different from what your measurements suggest. So if you're measuring and you have questions, uh, they're really happy to help you come up with a really good fit. Finally, the balance harness is not unlike the T-Touch harness in that it does have a clip on the front part so your dog doesn't have to put his head through the harness, nor does he have to do that with a T-Touch harness. The back is longer in the balance harness. So uh, the, the length of your dog's torso may be a factor. It is certainly adjustable top and bottom. It also has the clips front and back. Um, and, and if you go uh, that route, just make sure that the length is suitable for your dog. And certainly a long torso dog, it would make a lot of sense. Over here, we have a little picture of, uh, of a leash with a floating handle. The T-Touch Harmony leash is adjustable for different lengths. We prefer a leash that is not too short because a lot of dogs have a bigger space bubble than a short leash allows them to have. And they will actually be comfortable and more likely to respond well on a leash that is not as short. Um, doesn't mean we wanna be walking our reactive dog on a 20 foot leash. You know, crowded area, but, but we want to keep in mind our dog's comfort, both with space bubble and um, the, the physical leash itself. The floating handle keeps the pressure um, fluid. It, it doesn't, doesn't catch in the same way that a single point of contact would or, or a rigidly held leash would. The Freedom people, the folks who make the Freedom harness, make a Euro dog leash which is not to be confused with their training dog leash. The Euro leash is longer. And we think that one will work just fine if you like using the floating handle. Uh, we think that, and here, let me speak for you, Sarah. Um, but I think we're agreed that the training leash is, um, is, is too short, too but short. the Euro leash yes. um, would be good. Two other um, double-ended leads. Bold lead design is kind of the Cadillac of um, double-ended leads. It's my go-to. And um, the Mountain Dog Amazing Versatile Leash is made of um, uh, climbing rope. So it's very strong and they have a lifetime chew through warranty as well. Want to take a look at using a double-ended leash. Gonna do a little bit more with gear before we stop for questions, but keep your questions in mind and of course put them in the chat box. So you might ask, how am I gonna use a double-ended leash? Uh, so we have a little video that shows a couple of different aspects to it. Um, one is how you would use it with two hands um, to, to um, guide and, uh, and contain as necessary. The other one shows some ways you can use it with one hand. Let me go ahead and play that video. And there's not sound unless maybe there might be birds chirping in the video. So don't worry if you don't hear sound, it's all captioned.
Okay. I'm gonna head two questions that we usually get off at the pass. I, um, let's see, there we go. One is that is an eight foot leash. Usually people want to know because it does look, look longer. Um, there are handles that you can get to use with this leash. You, um, you would have to get it from um, probably the T-Touch people. You can get the floating handle all by itself that you can put your own leash in. And then the other question, I, don't, I have not checked chat yet, but- It's there. Um, it's there. Is there, okay, the <laughs> water ski position <laughs> is when the dog is a power boat and we're trailing behind. We're trailing behind, yeah. So um, yeah, when, once you've heard it and know what it is, you're like, oh my gosh, yes, if you find yourself being the skier behind your power boat <laughs> dog. So <laughs> I'm gonna move to um, one more slide and then we'll pause for, um, uh, for questions. Uh, I just I just knew those two would be there. So some other equipment you may wonder about, uh, the front clip harness, single point of contact, and the head halter. And um, so uh, let me talk about the front clip harness first, and then we'll touch base on the head halter. So for, um, for some dogs, the front clip harness is a good choice. Maybe they're not just terrible pullers, or if they pull the uh, because the clip is attached to uh, the front of the harness, it um, cues them uh, and, and actually prompts them to turn back towards you. So you don't get a lot of pulling. And when you do, you get a reorientation. So that's absolutely a benefit to using it. Um, and I will, will say I, um, crazy, my cocker is the bad puller in my house. And I, I will use it with her sometimes in a situation where it doesn't seem warranted to use both points of contact. A problem with the front clip harness is a dog's chest structure is not actually as solid as ours um, in that the, um, the sternum's not anchored in the way that it is for us. The torque of a dog continuing to pull against a front clip um, without interruption um, or doing it just a lot of the time, it can cause at least some considerable discomfort. And uh, there are those who um, you know, work in veterinary orthopedic medicine who believe that it can cause some more long lasting uh, problems for your dog. So if your dog's a big puller, um, you, maybe you wanna be looking at a double and it's um, double-ended arrangement, you know, two points of contact where you can minimize the extent to which there's uh, stress on your dog's chest. When would we use it? We use it, um, you know, just as described, if your dog finds that the signal's really meaningful, um, helps them reorient um, and where they aren't likely to injure themselves by uh, continued pulling. The head halter, as you can see here, now they come in all kinds of different arrangements now. Some have a, a point of contact at the back, which um, works by honestly the application of aversive pressure on the dog's nose to prevent them pulling forward. This one is a halt or a halty, um, the company name goes back and forth. Um, I think a gentle leader is similar where the point of attachment is under the chin. And what that allows you to do is it allows you um, to gently steer your dog to build a meaningful signal, I need you to turn this way, um, using, uh, using the leash attached to the head halter. I uh, recommend strongly, uh, and, and Sarah does too, that if you use a head halter, that you have that you use a double-ended leash and the other end of the leash is attached to a body harness. Because uh, having a dog on a single point of contact on a head halter risks injury if they hit the end of that leash really hard, they see a deer, they see, in my world, a skateboard, um, and um, hit that really hard, uh, there can be um, injury to the neck and spine. And there's, again, um, there's some um, information out there that suggests that to be the case. Obviously any gear, we wanna use it in a way that's thoughtful um, to prevent injury. That's one of the hazards of using uh, the head halter. 
it can be really effective with a dog um, that I like to describe as a dog that you have to tell on Tuesday um, that you would like them to turn on Thursday because especially large dogs, um, it can be really helpful if you have that um, load bearing harness and you've taught them that a little signal on the head halter uh, uh, means I'd really like you to turn this way. And I've had some client dogs who've become really quite sensitive to it. All right. Any questions now? Can we maybe go to the next slide? Oh, you want to go to the final one? Okay. Let's do one more slide and then we can take questions, I think. Okay, sorry. There That's we go. okay. There um, go. We do want to mention equipment to avoid. Um, prong collars, choke collars, shock collars, any kind of um, collar or device that adds aversion. Um, and what I mean by that is, is unpleasant to your dog either it's painful or unpleasant. Um, anytime you use some, uh, you know, something that's uncomfortable uh, and aversive to your dog to train, you run the, re the, the risk of creating aggression. And in fact, a lot of reactivity um, results from using these kinds of devices. And if you stop and think about it, it actually makes quite a bit of sense. So um, I, I imagine um, I am a dog, I'm on a prong collar, and I love other dogs. And I've been put on a prong collar because I pull and it's hard for my person to, to manage it, right? So I, the, the prong collar gets put on and we're walking along and I see a dog and I pull and it hurts and I stop pulling. And my person's back there saying, score, they're not pulling, that's great. What I'm thinking is, oh man, that really hurt. And we're walking along and I see another dog and I pull and it hurts. And I walk along, I see another dog and I pull and it hurts. And pretty soon I start to associate that discomfort or pain with the thing that I'm pulling towards. And so a lot of times, you know, something that my dog was initially excited about becomes a trigger for reactivity, All right? So I think one of the things about punishment devices is that they're very alluring in that when you start to use them in the beginning, you kind of feel like, oh, they work. They, you know, they make my dog stop doing this thing, but they're not addressing the underlying problem. And more likely than not, they're gonna create other ones. Um, it might be reactivity, it might be something else completely different, but they're gonna create anxiety. Um, and that's something that we don't wanna add. Um, the other thing that we uh, recommend avoiding is the retractable leash. So, there are, there are a lot of things with retractable leashes, but I think one is that there's always a little bit of pressure. And we were talking a bit about how um, when you add pressure to the leash, um, your dog feels it and responds to it, right? So they're always pulling into it. Um, and so, you know, so important with the work we're doing with our dogs is we're trying to keep the leash as loose as we possibly can. They're also quite dangerous. A dog sees a squirrel runs into the road and along comes a car. And while that may seem like that couldn't possibly happen, I just made that up. I didn't just make that up. <laughs> um, it, it happens. Um, there is not insignificant risk to you as a person. So say your dog does do that and you grab a hold of the thing to try to get them back because you can't like reel them in, right? So you're trying to, and it can cut into your skin and finger amputations are not unheard of. Um, with these retractable leashes. Uh, and I just can't, I, I don't have much, much flexibility to work with my dog. If I want to be, if I don't want to be in water ski position, I need to be able to gather up a little bit of slack and be next to my dog. Um, and I'm not going to be able to do that very effectively with a retractable. So all of those things I would avoid. Um, be careful about the shock collar because there are people who will call it all sorts of other things that aren't shock collar to yeah. make them to make it sound um, worse. <laughs> uh, or, uh, sorry, so to make it sound better than but it, uh, better than it actually is. So um, some of the names I've heard: e collar, stim collar. Um, believe it or not. I know someone who was told it was a massage collar. Um, no matter how light the shock is, 
it's aversive or it wouldn't work, right? So we want to we want to avoid it no matter what it's called. <laughs> okay, so I think we could probably take questions about equipment if uh, if we've got them, Liz. Yes, we do have a few. Um, one from Eric is about their reactive dog who was born without a front right leg. They've tried harnesses, but they aren't made for animals with the missing front leg. Any suggestions? There, there is one. And I can't remember what I, cause I had a client with a dog yeah. with a missing front leg and darn it, if I can remember which one they used. Do you have it there, Marnie? If not- I am, I'm looking it up. Yeah. Okay, good. Cause if you okay. can't find it, um, they could email us and I can, I can yeah. find it. Well, we'll go on yeah. while Marnie's looking. Um, we've had a few questions about gentle leaders, so I think you answered that. Oh, I did see um, one come in, Liz, um, that I wanted to touch on, not specifically gentle leader, but the figure eight head halter. Oh, yeah. Okay. Which, um, um, and the question basically was, uh, you know, they noticed reactive behavior after um, using it with their dog uh, almost right away. And it sounded like you stopped when you saw that, which is fabulous because I do think the figure eight head halter, actually any gear can be aversive for a dog. Um, but we've, we've um, you know, given you, um, you know, what's common, but uh, for some dogs, a head halter, they just never get used to it. And I think the way that the figure eight compresses, I think it may be aversive sooner. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Marnie. Oh, you're welcome. Let me go back and look for that harness. Um, Rachel says that her dog is afraid of harnesses, but is at risk of injury with just a collar and a leash. Any suggestion? She's also an escape artist and has gotten out of harnesses in the past. And I did post the training video in the chat Great. about how to train your dog putting their head through the harness themselves. Right. The other thing is that the, um, that the, the uh, let's see, which one? The T-Touch harness you can put it on like a collar um, so they don't even have to put their head through it, which might also be helpful. But that video is fabulous if you've got a, a harness that goes over the head. Um, yeah. And, you know, you might start to with really short periods of time where the harness goes on, uh, tons of delicious treats, maybe play with a favorite toy and then take it off. Um, and gradually get them comfortable. Some dogs get uncomfortable things on their body. I had a dog like that. Took us a little while. I do think the tea touch is hard to get out of. Probably yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're really concerned though about that, you can get a connector that goes from the collar to the harness, so that if they slip the harness, they still got the collar on. So that's another safety device. Um, from Diane, she has arthritis in her hands and has trouble opening the plastic clasp. Any any harnesses with the old fashioned metal clasp or any suggestions there? Hmm. Hmm. I think I if, you have a big, if you have a big dog, the clasps are bigger, which is helpful. But if you have a little dog, it's tricky. Except the big ones are, take more pressure. Yeah. Through your hand. I, boy, hmm. <laughs> I don't, I wonder. For a small dog, if that's an issue, I'd probably be looking at um, um, one of the uh, step-ins that only has the single clip. So it minimizes the extent to which you have to be. Yeah. Have to be. Clipped. And some of them, yeah, they have a single clip and some Velcro. That might be easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Lynn asked, what is the benefit of free shoulders? You were talking about that between the, um, when you were talking about the T-touch that it frees their shoulders. Oh, so the benefit of um, the shoulders being free um, is that it doesn't have, um, the gear does not affect your dog's gait. So the fact that they can move freely, it avoids chafing, but it also avoids, you know, imagine if you will, um, 
um, oh, I don't know, that you had a strap across the top of your arm all the time, that's going to affect, you know, long term, it's going to affect the strength of your arm and it's going to affect your movement um, in a way that at least you'll be compensating for that. And it might also have a longer lasting physical effect. Yeah, you can really do some yeah. serious uh, injuries. Yeah. Um, I saw just passing by in chat, people asking about the sensible harness and the easy walk. Um, and those, um, I think, well, particularly the, well, both of them, anything that has just um, that clip just on the front and comes sort of across the shoulders a bit like they do, um, they have a tendency to slide down and they are really easy to get out of. Um, so that's one thing and it cuts across the shoulder. So often the dog ends up being kind of hobbled. And I think sometimes people think, oh, they're not pulling, but the fact is <laughs> they can't walk. Um, and I don't think that's very healthy for the dog. What else? Uh, is, is the double leash good for small, mid-sized dogs as well? My dog is about 17 pounds and wears a back clip harness. He pulls a great deal. And I want to consider the double leash approach. I worry him about him getting tripped up with two leashes. So it's a single leash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, but she, she's interested in going to the double leash. Oh, gotcha. I understand. Okay. Double clip. Double Marnie, clip. Marnie uses has used it with her cocker, so you can speak to the smaller dog. Yeah, so my cocker, um, when she's at her fighting weight is uh, about, um, um, or her athletic weight is about 22 pounds. So that's still, you know, a good, um, um, you know, a third bigger than, than your 17 pound dog. I think it may be right on the edge, um, you know, for your 17 pound dog. Uh, and you would want to have a single leash that has a clip front and back, but but being careful not to get tangled in the um, in the front would of course be important. Um, and those uh, the mountain dog leashes they have a thinner one that might yes. be more appropriate. Yeah. So heavy. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. It still might might be heavy for a seventeen pounder. I've certainly used it with my um, twenty two pounder. But, yeah, I'm trying not to have a hard and fast answer. I think you're right on the edge. So if, if you're up for experimenting with it, one of the ways you can experiment without buying a new uh, leash is to get a carabiner clip to put it in the handle of your current leash and to attach, I would say with your little dog, I would attach uh, the, the leash's normal clip to the front so there's no handle for uh, your dog to get tangled up in and then attach the carabiner to the back and see if you and your dog like it, see how it works for you. You could potentially do that with like two four foot leashes too. Huh? You could, you could, oh yeah, absolutely. Connect them. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and just daisy chain them. Yeah. Uh, so um, Pug Joyride Harness also, I don't know if they have an adapted harness, but they say that they're good for tripods. So, and um, we had, uh, someone sent me a direct message. I think you meant to um, message everyone that the Kurgo dog harness does not have plastic clips. It has two metal connectors that you slide one through the other. Ah. So that might, that might work if um, mobility in your hands is an issue. Right. Well, it takes a village. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that tip. Uh, from Joel, why would a locking retractable, retractable be any different from a fixed length leash? I think it's because if you're, if you're working with your dog and say you need to get them closer to you, grabbing a hold of that uh, cord is going to be really challenging and potentially dangerous. Um, and remember, I mean, you've got that big handle to, to wrangle on, on top of that. I think it's much, much harder to use in a subtle way. I think you're going to find yourself getting kind of tripped up by it. Um, so. And also you may have um, seen in some of the leash videos that we weren't um, holding the leash only in one place. Exactly. We were changing it and, and manipulating that with um, 
with a retractable, it can be really pretty challenging. Mm -hmm. And depending if there's a lot of release and tug, release and lock, it can be um, confusing for your dog. Extremely, yeah. I think that's it for equipment questions. Okay. Marnie, what's our next question? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think we could take other questions, Liz, maybe that we haven't answered um, if you got them. All right, let me, um, let's see. We had a few questions that I've seen similar to Susan. My dog is over threshold and not responding to my redirection. What do I do? So the, the two techniques that we, we showed you, the find it and the, that backup recall or U-turn are things that potentially can work in that situation. Now, if you go out today and you try them in that situation, they aren't gonna work because they need to, you need to practice them first when there aren't distractions and much less a trigger, right? Yeah. So the trick is to practice them over and over. And as I, I think we've said, it's like, it's like creating muscle memory. So my dog here is find it and doop, their head goes straight down looking for the treats or I start doing a backup recall and my dog's like, oh, I love doing that backup recall. That's so much fun. Um, so the only way you get that is kind of like teaching a fabulous, just regular recall. If you want it to be rock solid, you've got to get to a place where you've rewarded it, practice it and rewarded it over and over and over again so that you can use it in those really difficult situations. And I know that's such an unsatisfactory answer because so I know we all want something that's easier, but it kind of is what it is. And, and let me just encourage you, uh, it, you can absolutely do it. I would say for, for my dog, um, find it, backup recalls didn't work very well for us. She didn't love doing them, but find it was a game changer. And I swear she saw, she would see a trigger and I'd think, oh, this is not a great situation. I can't do my my training with her, my click for looking, I'm just going to do find it. And it was almost as though she's like, Oh, thank you. Now I don't have to worry about that dog. I can just do this. Um, so it's a remarkably effective. Uh, that foraging instinct is really strong in a lot of dogs. Yeah. 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 Um, from Lisa, she is going on vacation at some point and would like to board her reactive dog. Is this a possibility or am I setting him up for increased fear and stress? Thinking of testing first with a, uh, with a day at doggy day daycare. Mistake? Hmm. So, um, <laughs> Go I'll it. start. Yep. Um, so it depends, which is you know, that hated answer. Um, there are some um, there are some places that will board your dog that take in only one dog at a time or one family's dogs at a time. Um, I and and that personally is is my choice for my own dogs if I can't have someone come into my home and stay with them. Uh, my preference is if someone can stay with them in my home. My next choice is someone that I know and trust who will take only my dogs. Um, and I have done um, uh, overnight test, but, um, or you could certainly do it for an afternoon. I would be reluctant to, um, so I love that you want to test. I'd be reluctant to put my reactive dog in daycare um, if you anticipate traveling soon. Um, I, I think you want to want to have a, um, have a good boarding situation, practice the boarding with someone who just does, um, you know, one dog and, and make sure that's going to work. I, you know, I always opted for someone coming and staying with my dog. Yeah. 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 I just mm -hmm. thought that worked really well. Yeah. We do have the, your dog's friend has a list of, um, dog sitters, border boarding situations on the, on their website. And that might be helpful. Yeah. Too. If you're local, yeah. If you're, uh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yes. You're in Canada, not so much. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. 
Um, you might, if you are not local, you might want to check the Pet Professional Guild listing. Um, um, they include folks who do um, boarding and daycare. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Um, we had a question about what is considered punishment yeah. behavior toward the dog when the dog is reactive. So punishment really is defined by your individual dog. Um, your dog gets to decide what, it, what he or she likes and what he or she doesn't like, what's aversive to them. Um, so I think what I would try to think about with this is how can I work with my dog so that it improves my relationship with my dog while I'm doing it? So for instance, doing a backup recall, um, that's something fun we do together. And that's going to build my relationship. Or if I do find it, my dog's like going to worship me because, oh my gosh, What's better than that? I just get to eat treats off the, the ground. Whereas yanking, even if it's not very hard or my least favorite sound on the planet, eh, eh, oh, <laughs> drives me crazy. Um, that's Mine's not crazy. really gonna, that's not gonna make my dog feel that great about me. So I'm looking for a way to make it um, affirmative rather than negative, if that makes sense. Um, Marnie, you want to comment on that? Because different things are reversive to different dogs. Right. And, and just as we spoke about with the head halter, um, you know, for some dogs, it's aversive for other dogs, not so much. Um, um, yeah, I, punishment is anything your dog finds unpleasant and it can tamp down a behavior in the moment, but um, um, it doesn't address the underlying cause. You know, some dogs like, you know, a big, robust, you know, just for example, big, robust petting all over their body. And for other dogs, they're like, oh, my gosh, get away from me. You know, even something as benign and affectionate as that for some dogs, um, you know, they can find that unpleasant. And so it would be punishing. Yeah. Um, another question from Patricia. Is there a proper way to hold a leash if the dog is pulling and not leaving the U. And I'm assuming she's talking about the U-turn. Oh, no, I think it's the, the slack in the leash. Oh, okay. the smile. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I got you, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wanna take it? I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> um, step number one, take our leash walking class. Uh, <laughs> it's online. A little, a little plug for my sponsor, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> We humans can get really busy, and this is, a, this is actually a, a big question, but I'll try to give you a, um, a focused answer. We can get really busy at our end of the leash, and actually we want to be as quiet as we can in our leash handling so that, um, so that let's say I'm holding the leash, I've got it anchored against my body, I've given my dog six feet of leash, everything else is folded up in my hand. If my dog pulls against it, uh, I'm not going to go with him. I'm not going to pull back, but he's going to figure out, um, oh my gosh, this is all I have. And you know, they'll begin to, uh, to if we are consistent, and that's, I know that's, that's um, easier said than done, they'll begin to learn, oh, if I keep the leash loose, that's how I pull forward. I mean, that's how I get to move forward. I don't get to, you know, pulling forward doesn't get me anywhere. Keeping the leash loose, just keeping a little slack in it, um, I get to go forward. One trick, again, easier, um, easier to, to see perhaps than to describe is if I've got a dog who's pulling in front of me um, and I have the elbow room to do it, I can absolutely, I can walk up the leash we often tend to stop at our dogs behind and think we're at their shoulder. I think if you get all the way to the shoulder, your dog is actually likely to give you at least a soupçon of um, attention, which is your opportunity to move them away. But the other thing is, if my dog's pulling forward, I can retain the pressure on the leash. 
I'm not going to add to it, but I'm not going to release it. My hands are going to be close to my body so that I'm not getting pulled over and they're going to be kind of on my waist. Um, I'm going to walk around as if my dog is facing um, 12 o'clock and I'm going to walk around the numbers of that uh, old fashioned analog clock until I'm at three o'clock or nine o'clock. And when I get there, that is going to relieve the pressure on the leash and my dog will have to rebalance. And again, that creates that moment for them to look back at me and re-engage them. And again, any of these things we want to practice when nothing's happening, when there's nothing drawing them. I would also just say, in addition to wrangling the leash, remember that you don't want to reward what you don't like the pulling you do want to reward what you do like and and you know and teach them the thing you want and so making sure too that you're rewarding the good thing and not waiting for the bad thing and reacting to it i think a lot of training goes yeah. wrong so you know some of these things marnie are great because it gets you out of that situation um but if you can reward you know, some of that nice leash walking, that's also going to help. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we had a question pop up. Um, Peggy, I saw it before and I'm glad you popped it up again because I wanted to um, throw it to Sarah, which is, um, is it okay to pick up my dog to get them out of a situation where they're already reacting? <laughs> Funny I'm you guessing should. your dog's not a Mastiff. It's a wild guess, but. Uh, but is it a 50 pound hound? Um, <laughs> so it, uh, here we go again. It depends. It depends on the dog. For some dogs being picked up makes them feel more vulnerable and worse. For some dogs, it makes them feel safer. And so I think it's a matter of figuring that out for your dog. Um, I will say, so I laughed about that because my 50 pound hound uh, if I saw an off-leash dog coming, I would pick her up and she'd be completely calm. Problem is I couldn't hold her for very long, but, uh, you know, for her, that, that helped her a great deal, uh, even with the dog coming at us. So there you go. Um, you know, so if you feel like it, it calms your dog, I think it's really okay to do. They're not learning anything in that moment. So if you want to work on getting them more comfortable um, you know, doing some of this training can really help, but if you get yourself in a bind and they feel more comfortable being picked up, that can get you out of a situation. Sure. Okay. Um, from Anne, is there a positive reason for dogs to bark at things? At time, my dog seems to enjoy it as sport, wanting to be at the window or screen porch to bark at things or to look for things. Mm -hmm. I'll take a stab and then Marnie, if you want to add on. Um, sure. The one thing about dogs barking out the window, uh, I think we think of it as being enjoyable for them. I think a lot of times it actually isn't, it's a little bit like feeling like they have to be on patrol. Uh, and that is pretty anxiety producing. If you're kind of worried about what's out there all the time um, and prepared to, to scare it off. Um, and the other thing to remember is that as my dog gets hyped up and starts barking, all of their stress hormones are going through their body. And again, I'm, I'm putting my dog really close to threshold even when they're not barking. So one of the things that we find is if you can prevent your dog from barking out the window, uh, a lot of times your work outside with them uh, on a walk goes much, much better because when you walk out the door, they aren't already like right that threshold. You've got, you know, they've got more resources to call upon if they haven't been doing that. So I would try, try <coughs> excuse me, to prevent that. You can, um, there are a number of ways to do that. One is to keep them from being in a room where they're able to do that. Um, the other thing, window film, you can buy window film that's, um, it's not sticky. It, it sticks through static to the window. So you can take it off if you hate it, <laughs> right? But you can put it on there. And most of them, um, they have different patterns, but you can get one, say, that's like frosted, put it as high as your dog can see out, light comes in, but um, they, they can't look out. Uh, and so that's, that's another option. Yes, I have that over four of my windows. 
Okay. It works fantastically. Yeah. Um, some of the your answers on that barking out the window, I think, apply to this, but uh, Rhea wanted to know if you would address reactive behavior when the dog is in a fenced front yard. Take it away, Mark. Okay. So um, basically what our dogs practice becomes more likely behavior. So if your dog is reacting, you know, continually in the fenced front yard, that behavior is going to become more likely. So you can um, absolutely, if you have sufficient distance or are able to reduce the intensity in some way, um, sometimes some of the um, gardening uh, screen that you can put over a fence to reduce the uh, visibility can uh, buy you, a, you know, can, can make it possible to work with the amount of distance you have in the front yard. Uh, I would be doing click for looking in the front yard when a uh, trigger goes by. And when I can't manage my dog's uh, awareness of triggers, when I can't prevent them from feeling the need to react in that way, just as with the front window, um, I would prevent their access to the front yard um, so that they aren't practicing that behavior. I don't know if either of you would have any answers to this, but there have been a f quite a few questions about cicadas. I'm sure you knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's I understand they're tasty treats. <laughs> Just yes, preventing, my dog. preventing them from eat, being eaten and, you know, from barking and at them. Barking, barking at cicadas. cicadas. That's cool. hysterically funny. So the good news is it's not going to last very long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I laugh because people always are ask, asking <coughs> for advice and I'm like, I can't get my own dog to stop eating. Them. <laughs> I'm just counting on the fact it's not going to last too long. Yeah. Well, I just saw something come in. What, what are, what is cicadas for someone who's in England? There are these bugs. Um, Locusts. Yeah, they're type. Yeah, well, they're actually they're type of grasshopper. I read, but oh. they they burrow underground and for different uh, periods of time. And the one that we're experiencing on the east coast right now are it's they are they go underground for seventeen years and then they all come out. <laughs> and it's called the X swarm. <laughs> yes, and it's really they're everywhere, um, and they'll go away. But it's quite yeah. awful. And for some reason, dogs seem to absolutely love them. Oh, yeah. um, remember, uh, eating a few is not the end of the world. Um, you don't want them gorging themselves because they can have digestive upset, but they aren't poisonous or anything like that. Right, right. You know, you could practice your backup recall before you're out <laughs> with cicadas. And as you see your you dog head, you know where to that go, backup honey. recall. There's Pardon nowhere me? to go. You back up recall right into another cicada. I mean, there's no way. <laughs> well, my cicadas are contained right now, so well, we have places to go, but yeah. yeah I, had yeah. A, I had someone in one of my classes say the other day, it's like they're eating Fritos out on the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> we had mm -hmm. some questions about training two dogs when one or both dogs mm -hmm. are reactive. Yeah. Um, I'll just give you the quick answer is that um, we don't recommend doing it until each dog has really um, strong ability to move away from the trigger, um, you know, to, um, to contain themselves when you're out on a walk. You know, and once each dog has that ability, you can perhaps team up with someone to wrangle the other dog and then, um, you know, gradually, gradually work up. We did have a question about um, supplements or medication. Do you have any thoughts about that? I think Marnie and I are uh, of the same mind with this. So there are different types of supplements um, that do not require a uh, prescription. Uh, there's one called anxetine. Um, uh, there's one called Zilkeen. There are a bunch of them. Your vet would know about them. Um, anytime I give my dog something to ingest, I would want to talk to my vet about it. Um, for some dogs, they can be helpful. 
for some, not as much. It, it's it's variable, but there are some that have been tested, and in some you know, in some cases can absolutely help. As far as regular medication goes, um, I think if you try the training and you just you get no traction, there's no distance at which your dog can stay calm, um, or you know it's just it, you, the moment your dog steps outside the door, they're so hyper vigilant that they can't eat anything, they can't do anything. Um, I think then, you know, medication, some sort of anxiety medication can be a really good thing because it can help your dog uh, be able to uh, be in a place where they can, they can learn, basically, um, bring them down just enough. It's not going to fix the reactivity, but it's going to make it easier to work with them and do the training. Um, so I think, you know, it's a definite option, but I would in most cases, try working on some of this first to see if you can you can make some progress. You want to add something to that, Marnie? Um, um, no. Oh, okay. You look like something was going on. <laughs> no, I, I apologize. I distracted myself by a um, by a question in chat. Oh, okay. I thought maybe we should um, answer, which was, um, um, will my dog grow out of it? Someone wrote, you know, has a, has a German Shepherd, age two, has been barking and jumping at other dogs who approach them, focuses well until she's in that position, loses it, no amount of treats will get her to focus as we approach. Um, so constantly crossing the road, fabulous. That's rock star, hide behind cars, but sometimes it's unavoidable. And she doesn't have any problems at agility class with the dogs there, will she grow out of it? I would say, um, and then Sarah would love for you to weigh in, um, the agility class, it's possible that she shut down, but it's also possible that it's a very controlled situation. Um, and so she knows what to expect and people may be savvy enough that, um, you know, that they're keeping distance um, and such. If it's an issue when another dog approaches, then I would um, add distance, you know, it's, it's a boring but um, um, you know reliable answer. If you see a dog approaching and you your experience tells you this isn't going to go well, this hasn't gone well, um, use your backup recall, use your U-turn. Um, you know if you're in a space like some of the uh, successful setups, rather than going back the way you came, you know, go to the right or go to the left and just change it up so that she doesn't practice that behavior. Yeah, and if you can find a place to work on some setups, it's gonna be easier in that situation, yeah. right? Yeah. Once you've done yeah. some of that basic training. Yeah. yeah. And depending on the distance, if you build a really powerful find it, that may be helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Moving past. Well, we had an earlier question from Kayla about introducing a reactive dog to a new dog in the family. The non-reactive dog already lives in the home. The reactive dog will be coming into the home. Okay. So, <laughs> I have lots of thoughts floating in my yeah, head. Yeah, yeah, I too. Um, the first and foremost, take it very, very slowly. So I would plan for a while to, to keep them separate unless, yes. you know, uh, it, it, it may go better than you think, but you know, you want to err on the side of caution. I would, um, try introducing them with something between them, some sort of gate or fence and work that way first and we come close together and we each get treats we come move away come together and we can eat some treats um, assuming that there's not a reaction in that moment mm -hmm. um, if you can have the reactive dog in a contained area off the leash it may make it easier um, it might go okay uh, you know it's going to really depend too on the reactive dog how how much they can handle. Remember too, when you're adopting a new dog, they're going to be anxious. So that reactivity, they're going to be closer to the threshold and that reactivity is going to be right there at the surface. So giving them time to decompress separated can also be really, really good. Um, Marnie, you want to um, 
just the only thing I would add, well, I would add two things. Um, one is it's possible that um, you want to create an airlock rather than a single barrier, depending on how the dogs react. Um, so that would be like two X pens or an X pen and a date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a little bit of space between, and you can even do click for looking in that situation. Absolutely. Um, and the other thing is, did you mention parallel walking, Sarah? Well, I was staying away from it because most leash reactive dogs. That's true. Don't necessarily, it's possible you could get it to work, but it doesn't, that's why I, w I always think, you know, fence between them works a little right. bit better to get rid of the leash. Yeah. And yeah, whenever I think of parallel walking, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to live just a little east of a bunch of farms. So it'd be a couple of dogs at, you know, big distance on long lines. Yeah. Yeah, but not everybody has that. No. Okay. Sarah, it is 4.10. I think we probably need to stop because I know you have something coming up pretty quickly. <laughs> I want to thank you two for a great job. I know everyone learned a lot and I want to thank everyone else for joining us. Um, there it is. Good. <laughs> Contact information. I was going to ask you about that. There it is. <laughs> and if, you know, if you found this really helpful, I would say look into the class. It's, you know, it, it's this and then some. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so if you need, you know, you'd like the extra help, we're, we're there. Yeah. And yeah, we'd be glad to have you. Okay. Well, goodbye to everyone. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Marnie and Sarah, go on with the rest of your day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Nice to see everybody. <laughs>